Okay, good morning. Um, today we are going to uh, continue our discussion uh, about uh, DNA. And uh, importantly, we're going to discuss some of the features of the DNA molecule uh, that actually uh, support the method of DNA replication that takes place inside uh, of our cells. And also we will uh, end up talking about um, some laboratory techniques for how we can uh, artificially replicate DNA in the laboratory uh, for the sake of doing different types of um, uh, research on the molecule. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and um, think about where we left off last time. We said that uh, DNA is a very long uh, polymer molecule. Our cells in our bodies have uh, DNA packaged not just as free floating naked DNA, the double helical DNA strand, but we've learned that the DNA must be packaged up uh, with different proteins that not only help condense and physically fit our human genome into the tiny nuclei of our cells, but also the fact that it's packaged as chromatin provides a way for our cell to control what regions of the DNA are accessible so that the genetic information, the sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's in a particular region on a chromosome uh, can be read and accessed. So remember, each of our cells that has a nucleus in our body has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome is one big long uh, DNA molecule, right? So get, we have 22 autosome pairs uh, and a pair of sex chromosomes. And we always have to remember that each one we have a pair because one comes from mom and one comes from dad. Right. So obviously it's, a quite a challenge uh, for our cells to be able to manage our DNA, not only to organize it, protect it from being uh, damaged, but also to be constantly accessing it in order to make use of the information inside. Uh, an important function of our cells is to be able to replicate our DNA. Uh, because of course, our cells, when they divide, they have to first make a complete copy of the human genome, your human genome, uh, and be able to successfully pass um, those copies on to the daughter cells. Uh, so let's think about some of these challenges here. Right? So the DNA double helix, it's made of four different nucleotides. Um, the structure of it is in this double-stranded alpha helix. We said it's a right-handed helix. It's not entirely symmetrical. Right? There is, uh, because of the peptide, the phospho, uh, not peptide, sorry, the phosphodiester backbone that's linking the nucleotides to each other, there's going to be a natural kind of angle introduced as one nucleotide is linked to the next. And that angle is what results in this spiral, right? But it's not a completely symmetrical spiral. And that's why you end up with um, major groove areas and minor groove areas of this double helix. Yeah. Uh, an important consideration for the cell is that it has to be able to maintain the specific base pair sequence of these DNA molecules as they're being copied or replicated. And this might seem very overwhelming when you consider that the entire human genome, if you were to add together all of your uh, 23 chromosomes, right, if we said, yeah, even if you just took one copy of your genome, like let's say the one from mom, right? So you got 23 chromosomes from mom. The biggest chromosomes like chromosome one are like something like, you know, 250 million base pairs, right? Even the smallest chromosomes, uh, which are not chromosome 22, but actually chromosome 21, you know, that's still something like um, 50 million uh, base pairs, right? So that's a lot. When you add it all together, the human genome is 3.2 billion base pairs uh, of DNA, right? So just think about that, how amazing it is that our cell has to manage this and manage it successfully. Otherwise, life can't work. 
So consider that our cells must have a system of DNA replication that meets these challenges every time they divide. And if this system of how to make sure the DNA is replicated properly failed, you know, we would no longer be able to grow or reproduce or even continue living, right? Because life itself, our life is depend upon our cells successfully reading the right genetic sequence that's present in the DNA that's being passed from cell to cell as cells divide. So a crucial concept here that I think you're all aware of is that the DNA replication process is what we call semi-conservative. What we mean by that is because of the double helix nature of the DNA, DNA is two single-stranded polymers that are together, you know, held together by these hydrogen bonds of these complementary base pairs through the middle. Because they are complementary, you always have an A across from a T, you always have a G across from a C. That means each strand already contains all the information you need, right, in order to make another strand to match up with it. Uh, so that sounds very simple in concept, and it is simple in concept, and that's why it works for life, right? Because it's an incredibly elegant way of encoding for genetic information. So that means if you have this double helix here, let's say we have a starting molecule of DNA, the double helix, if you were to separate these strands, so let's follow the fact that the original two strands that make up the original molecule are dark navy blue in this cartoon. If you were to separate those strands, each one of those dark navy blue strands has all the information you need to make a light blue strand complementary to it. And therefore you would end up with two double alpha helixes or two DNA molecules starting from one. As this process continues, from two to four, I mean, you know, it goes from two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, you know, on and on and on. But maybe the one thing you don't really think about is the original dark blue navy strands, dark blue, dark navy blue strands, right, are still present no matter how far down this um, path you go, right? Somewhere in there, even if you're up to millions and millions of DNA strand, uh, double helixes, those original two single stranded dark navy blue strands would be in there somewhere in a couple of those molecules. And to me, I think that is kind of a neat philosophical uh, question, right? Because of course you started life as an egg that was fertilized, right? So half of your genome came from mom in the egg, half of your genome came from dad in the sperm, and that formed a diploid fertilized egg that had two copies of uh, the human genome in it, right? So those would have been your original molecules, the actual molecules that your mom and dad started you off with, right? And then the fertilized egg would have divided into two. That means, right, each one of those chromosomes would have had to have replicated. So the original, let's say this was the chromosome one that came from mom, right? It had to replicate so that then it could go into two daughter cells and on and on and on, eventually leading to what you are today, 35 trillion cells, right? All from that original set of DNA molecules. And the thing that I think is kind of philosophical and interesting is that theoretically, that means it's possible that somewhere in your body right now are the original dark navy blue strands that you started off with, right? So it's kind of interesting to think about that way. Do I think it's likely? I'm not sure because of course, along the way, depending on where these strands ended up in which cells, if those cells died and had to be recycled, then all the genetic material, the actual molecules of DNA in that cell would also be recycled and broken down, right? But it is kind of neat to think about. Okay. So how does the DNA replication process start? Right. So you have the double-stranded helix. We already said 
that the importance of that double helix being held together by hydrogen bonds down the middle between the base pairs, right, is no coincidence. Right? Life evolved to use that system because the hydrogen bonds are a relatively weak bond across the middle. Now, the A's across from T's, right, remember they form two hydrogen bonds across, two sets of little dotted lines. C's and G's can form three hydrogen bonds, three sets of dotted lines. That means A's and T's are an even weaker interaction than C's and G's. So as it turns out, along our chromosomes, <clears throat> let's pretend here this is one chromosome. Again, let's say this is chromosome one that came from mom. Remember, chromosome one, all chromosomes are, are just one big long molecule of DNA, right? Each chromosome is just one single molecule of DNA wrapped up with proteins as chromatin. <clears throat> along each chromosome, you'd find certain regions where the sequence um, is enriched in A's and T's, right? So as you're going along, you're reading sequences, and your DNA sequence, you expect there to be, you know, just if it was by chance, just as many C's and G's as you'd find A's and T's in a sequence, but certain stretches through evolution uh, are conserved that have way more A's and T's in them through that stretch. Right? We call these just consensus sequences. You know, consensus means like, you know, if you take a vote, it's like, what's the most popular thing? You reach a consensus, right? So what they're saying here is that there are certain stretches of our DNA that show this very popular type of sequence in it. And you can see here, it's showing you that it's just a big stretch of A's and T's with relatively few G's or C's in there. Uh, you know, the way they write this is that at this position here in, a, in this consensus sequence, you'd find either an A or a T on this strand. So that means the opposite strand would have a T or an A right over there. But then certain regions, you see um, it's almost always like three Ts, an A and a T on one. Right? Because of that, these little stretches tend to be weaker, right? That's where the DNA double helix tends to come apart way easier, especially if you have certain proteins. So these are proteins represented by these blobs here. Remember, these are peptide chains of amino acids that are the right shape to form these little machines that recognize these consensus sequences, right, and encourage that region to be able to separate. So this does not happen like at the end of a chromosome and then you have to expect that the whole chromosome somehow unzips from one end to the other, because that would not be efficient. I already told you, like chromosome one is something like 250 million base pairs, right? If you had to just start from one end and unzip it, right, it would take a long time. So in reality, when it comes time to replicating our DNA, the chromosomes just start separating in different spots all along the length of the chromosome where you have these kind of weaker consensus sequences. We call these origins of replication. And again, they're helped by these proteins that can bind there and encourage the DNA strands to open up. Once these uh, origins of replication begin to get bigger and bigger, you can imagine each one, let's say there's like a left side to it in the figure and a right side to it, as the bubble is getting bigger, right? That replication fork is beginning to move in either direction. Uh, and so these replication bubbles then eventually start, they start fusing with each other. Right? And at a certain point, these bubbles are big enough that we just call them replicons. So these are particular regions where active DNA replication and new copies of DNA are being made. So the dark navy blue strands are the original strands in the double helix. You'll notice that the moment these bubbles start forming and get larger into these replicons, the light new DNA strands are being laid down in them, right? So that at a certain point, when the replicons get big enough that they actually fuse together. So here you have the replication fork of this one going from left to right the replication fork of this one on this side is going from right to left and they would fuse together, right? Eventually then that's how you now end up with two completely separate double-stranded 
uh, DNAs, right? So by doing it this way, the process is much faster. If each of your chromosomes uh, replicates this way, the entire human genome is copied by our cells in about eight hours, right? about eight hours to copy 3.2 billion base pairs uh, and importantly, do it accurately. Okay. So you can see in the figure here, so this is one uh, double-stranded DNA, like in, you'd find in one chromosome. And if you follow it around, it's still double-stranded up here. But when you get to over here, you can see, oh, here's a little origin of replication, a little bubble forming. Here, if you continue on, here's a larger one, right? You can see that the, you now have in this region two double-stranded uh, DNA sides to it. Um, and eventually, as this keeps happening, you'll end up with two complete uh, chromosomes. So what's going on inside of that replicon? What is the light blue line, the new DNA? How is it being made in there? It's being made by a, an important series of proteins, including this large complex of proteins known as DNA polymerase 3. All right, so by its name, polymerase, you can already tell its job is it helps make polymers. And in this case, it makes polymers of, of, uh, of nucle nucleotides into a big nucleic acid polymer. Right. So the DNA Pol 3 inside the bubble would be reading the navy blue strand as the original template, right? That's the original DNA strand. So the sequence of nucleotides in that is what's going to serve as the template to make the light blue copy strand. Right, that's going to be growing inside of the replicon. DNA Pol 3, importantly, okay, it can only move in one direction. So what it's going to do is it's going to bind to the three prime end of the growing DNA strand, right? Remember, the DNA strand has a five prime and a three prime end. The five prime because this nucleotide up here, the last one, the very last thing is the phosphate group sticking out of it, right? That's attached to the five prime carbon. Whereas the other end of the strand, right? The last thing sticking out is just the hydroxyl, hydroxyl group from the carbon three of the um, deoxyribose ring. So that's why we call it the free three prime end. DNA polymerase will add the next nucleotide onto the three prime end of the growing DNA strand. Right? The way it works is that you can see here, as this growing strand is growing in a five prime to three prime direction, the DNA polymerase is tightly associated with it. It would be wrapped around it, okay? And it would also be wrapped around uh, the template DNA strand. Right, so this DNA Pol3 complex is actually pretty huge in the picture. It should be drawn like it's surrounding both of these strands here. All right, but for simplicity's sake, let's just keep it off to the left. Surrounding these DNA molecules is a whole pool of free floating nucleotides, right, that can be drawn from to put the next one into the right spot. This is important. The free floating nucleotides Right, are floating around as triphosphate nucleotides. So you can see here, you have a thymine you know, nucleotide that's made up of not just one phosphate, which would be a monophosphate, right? but it has a diphosphate, a triphosphate. So these are a pool of deoxynucleoside triphosphates that are floating around. All right, so we typically call these DNTPs because they're deoxynucleosides uh, and they're triphosphates. Right? Why right, would the DNA Pol3 be, be pulling from a pool of triphosphates if in reality, the nucleotides, when it gets added to the growing strand, gets added as a monophosphate? It does so because it uses the high energy bond here of these two extra phosphate groups attached to the first phosphate, that provides the energy. Remember, there are electrons in that bond. And even though this bond is pretty stable, these electrons are at a pretty high energy. Why? Because phosphate groups are really bulky. 
So they are kind of repelling each other. So you can already imagine that the electrons that are involved between, let's say, this oxygen and this phosphate over here, right? Already the electrons, there's some sort of like actual physical kind of uh, repulsion going on. So those electrons want to be able to kind of get out of that situation and get to a better, um, a, a better bond situation, right? Uh, and that better bond situation is offered by the hydroxyl group on the three prime end of the last nucleotide that's on the growing DNA strand, right? Because interacting the electrons involved here would much rather interact with the hydroxyl group over here because it's much less sort of repulsion Right. in terms of charge and in terms of uh, the bulkiness of the phosphate groups kind of uh, pushing against each other. So DNA Paul 3 facilitates that, right? DNA Paul 3 would be the right shape to be able to hang on to this uh, dinucleoside triphosphate right? and put it in exactly the right position so that this oxygen over here on this phosphate would rather than uh, its electrons would rather than interact with the free hydroxyl group here, right? Thereby releasing these um, extra inorganic phos phosphates to float away, all right? So importantly, you say, well, so we know that on the template strand, there's an A, an adenine, right? So you say, yeah, that's why the thymine will end up being the next thing added, right? But how does the thymine know that? Right? How does the thymine know that it should be the one that floats in here, right? So that the DNA Paul three can add it on. It doesn't know anything. It's just a molecule floating around. The truth is, at any given moment, a guanine trinucleotide could float in here as well, right? Or another adenine could float in here as well, but those would not form the proper hydrogen bonds across the way with the adenine, and as a result those trinucleotides would not fit in there very stably. They kind of float in there, nothing to really properly hold them in there, and they'd float out, right? But if a thymine trinucleotide happens to float in there, it will be stabilized temporarily by forming those hydrogen bonds with the adenine, right? By being stabilized, it's held in there just long enough that the DNA Paul three that's there has a chance to facilitate the, the interaction with the free three prime hydroxyl group of the last nucleotide. So that's how it works. So if you were to imagine this happening, like in real life, right, all kinds of other nucleotides would be floating in here, falling out, floating in there, floating away. But then if a thymine comes along, it's stabilized long enough for the DNA Paul three to do its thing, all right? And the thing, once again, is taking advantage of the fact that you have electrons going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, right? And that's why it's thermodynamically favorable. Right? And this again is a polymerization reaction. Okay, so here you have a much nicer realistic diagram of this. So here's the DNA Paul three complex. You can see it's made up of different separate proteins. That's why you have these orange blobs, yellow blobs, red blobs, together they form a functional machine, right? You can tell from this picture here, if you didn't have the orange or if you didn't have the yellow or if you didn't have the red, things wouldn't be coming together as nicely as you see here. Some of these are responsible for hanging on to the DNA double helix. Right? Some of these are responsible for um, uh, being able to, uh, no, sorry. Some of these are responsible for hanging on to the single-stranded DNA that's coming in, uh, in here, right? And they are the right shape then as the new nucleotides are being put on here, right? So that the double-stranded uh, DNA is coming out the other side, right? And this DNA Paul three is moving in this slide from top to bottom, reading the template strand and adding onto it um, the light blue, uh, making the light blue a growing strand. And again, you can see certain proteins in this complex are in charge of actually putting on the nucleotides here. So a big protein complex like this is oftentimes called a holo enzyme complex, meaning it's a whole bunch of proteins that together, they must be together in order to work as the complete machine, right? Each little separate colored region is a separate piece 
or part of the machine. <clears throat> so how quickly does this happen? Right? You might say that doesn't sound very efficient. You have to wait for the right DNTP to just float in there in order for the uh, DNA Pol 3 to add it on. But you know, this is a very refined machine. The shapes of the proteins are perfect for hanging on to the, the DNA and doing this. So the DNA Pol 3 can add um, upwards of 33 bases per second. Right? That's really fast. So this thing would be zipping along here adding 33 of these things per second. So this also makes you realize that the pool of free floating DNTPs, there has to be a lot of these molecules, right? If, you're, if everything is just surrounded by these and the right one has to get in there. And that's true because in our cells, the, the water that's in our cells is filled with all kinds of molecules. It's a big soup of things. Um, and things are just bumping into each other and we count on having enough of each of the DNTPs present so that this process of the DNA Pol 3 moving along can work efficiently. So here is a picture then of these replicons, these bubbles that are growing, right? And so each bubble has replication forks on either side of the bubble, right? And these are just forks where the DNA double helix is separating and these forks are moving to the left and to the right. If we were to zoom in, to this replication fork over here, and we, and we blow it up and it looks like this, we say, oh yeah, so we have the original two template strands of the original double helix. And remember in the, in the alpha helix, they are anti-parallel, right? One is five prime to three prime in one direction. That means the other one is three prime to five prime in the other direction as pictured here. For this template strand, the navy blue one on the bottom of this cartoon, you know, no problem, right? Here's the DNA polymerase three, it's attached in there and it's reading the template strand from a three prime to five prime direction right? so that the new strand, the light blue strand that the polymerase is laying down is made itself in a five prime to three prime direction. Right? Because that's the only direction that DNA Pol 3 works. And you say, why? Why does it only have one direction to it? Because again, this is a complex machine, right? It's not symmetrical, right? So it works, it's designed to work in one direction, but not the other. You know, a simple way of thinking about this is our bodies, you know, we think of our bodies as symmetrical right and left, but we're not symmetrical top and bottom. Right? So if you walked up to, let's say, a coconut tree and you wanted to try to climb the coconut tree, you know, you, your body works much better in one direction, you know, climbing up, reaching up with your hands and using your feet to push yourself up. Can you imagine trying to go backwards up the tree with your feet first and then your hands pushing, right? The shape, the shape of your body makes it so that you can climb the tree much easier in one direction and you can't climb the tree in the other direction, right? So same thing. The DNA Pol 3 holoenzyme complex evolved to work in one direction, but not the other. So you got a problem here, right? Because it can read this bottom template strand just fine, but what's going on up here, right? Because if a DNA Pol 3 complex were to bind to this template strand, right, and try to start making a new strand in this direction from left to right also, as the fork itself is moving from left to right, that's not going to work, right? Because DNA Pol 3 can't work backwards like that. It can only read the template strand if, if it's reading the template strand three prime to five prime. Huh. But clearly, right, you can see here in the cartoon, there is a new strand being put down there, right? How does that work? So the solution is while the leading strand the one on the bottom in this cartoon can be made continuously, right? The DNA Pol 3, you can almost imagine, it's constantly following the separation of this replication fork from left to right. The lagging strand, the upper strand in the cartoon here must be made going the other direction, right? And that is kind of weird because you think, oh, okay, that means if the polymerase three were to attach here, right, at this fork, it could read the template strand going this way. So it could lay down the new strand going that direction, but then this fork keeps moving to the right. 
So that means the new, the lagging strain has to be made in different fragments as the replication fork is moving away and new parts of the template strand are exposed. So short fragments that start from the fork and head backwards. So that's what's depicted here. Okay, so in this replicon, so this particular spot on a chromosome that's um, uh, being replicated, the right part of it is, is um, uh, a replication fork moving to the right here. So as a result, I know this is kind of confusing because in this figure, they've made the, the, this navy blue upper template strand have its five prime end on this side and its three prime end on the left, which is different than the previous slide. But whatever, you should be able to understand um, that it's kind of flipped around here. So that means on this strand, the upper template strand, the DNA polymerase can easily move and make uh, the um, continuous leading strand from the five prime to three direction in this direction following the replication fork. But on the lagging strand side, as the fork is moving away, the DNA polymerase, because again, it can only um, synthesize the new strand in a five prime to three prime direction. It has to do it in these little fragments as more and more of the template becomes available as the fork moves away. <clears throat> Those fragments are called Okazaki fragments, named after the researcher who discovered them. Right. Importantly, DNA polymerase cannot start from scratch. Right. The DNA polymerase machine, the hollow enzyme, cannot just arbitrarily attach to some spot on the template strand and start going because it's designed to only be able to add the next nucleotide to a pre-existing three prime nucleotide. Right. So that means you actually have to put down here these little red bits to get the DNA Paul three started. These little red bits are bits of RNA, not DNA. Right? And they are laid down by an enzyme that can make these short little RNA primers um, starting from scratch, right? So RNA polymerases can start from scratch. They don't need to have an existing fragment to add onto. RNA polymerases can just start somewhere in the middle and make RNA. Right? DNA polymerases cannot do that. So that's why the way it works is RNA fragments get laid down first. And these fragments are, of course, complementary to the DNA, the navy blue strand. Right? Once you have a free three prime end of the RNA, then the DNA polymerase can start adding nucleotides to that. Right? And eventually, when it reaches the start of the next fragment, these RNA primers have to be removed. Why? You're like, well, why can't you just leave it in there? Because it's the right sequence to match up. Because it's RNA, not DNA. And you're like, so what? Right? If it matches, it matches. No, because remember, the ribose sugar in RNA still has a hydroxyl group at the uh, carbon two, right? compared to the deoxy um, carbon two in DNA. As a result, if you have a strand of RNA, right, the bond angles that kind of encourage the alpha helical structure are not going to be the same, right? So that means if you had a stretch of DNA, the double helix, and in the middle, part of it was RNA, that little part of it is not going to be the right spiral staircase. It's gonna get messed up. So even though we need the RNA primers to start this, right, those RNA primers have to be removed so that DNA polymerase can then fill in the rest of the light blue um, strand and connect it. So you have one continuous copy strand now. Keep in mind that in this figure, right, there's sort of like a mirror image on either side because the replication fork on this side is going to the left. And that means the side where the leading strand can be made continuously and the side where the lagging strand is made by Okazaki fragments, it's kind of opposite to what's going on on the right side of this bubble. Okay. So here's another illustration showing some of these proteins that are involved in these processes. So the double-stranded DNA, the original template strands, are kind of unzipped or encouraged to keep unzipping 
by the action of, of uh, proteins known as helicases. So this green blob is a protein that unwinds the helix, right? So at this particular site, already the DNA was a bit weaker because it's rich in A's and T's instead of C's and G's. So you got a little bubble forming. And then these other proteins come in like the helicases and really now start unzipping um, the DNA heading in either direction, uh, the replication forks, right? Uh, here you have the DNA polymerase three that, um, you know, if you look at the cartoon that it started from, it started from this little RNA primer up here and was able to continuously make the leading strand right, heading in this direction from right to left. On the other strand, you have to have these primase proteins uh, that come and they're essentially RNA polymerases, right? They're laying down the short little RNA primers because RNA uh, polymerases evolutionarily can start from scratch, right? They can just attach here and start making an RNA primer where there was nothing to start with. Right? Um, then the DNA Paul three, we already talked about that. The DNA Paul three then is in charge of then adding on DNA bases at the free three prime end of the RNA primer, right? And eventually you're going to have, um, let's see, uh, the DNA Paul one, so a different hollow enzyme, not DNA polymerase three. This is a different machine that would remove the RNA primer, get that out of there, and encourage then a DNA ligase protein to kind of then join the 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 two um, fragments together. So now you have one continuous strand of DNA once the RNA is removed, and once the RNA Paul three has filled it in, the DNA ligase then would actually connect um, the two fragments. So that's basically what happens inside of our living cells. And I think, you know, I, I think you've learned this kind of thing before, but maybe not in that same depth. And I hope you find that actually kind of amazing when you think about it right? That you're, this is what goes on inside of your living cells and it has to work, right? Because if it doesn't work, well, you're in trouble, right? So we can uh, use many of these same principles to artificially or synthetically replicate DNA in a test tube, in a lab, right? because you can think about decades and decades ago, if people wanted to research the DNA, let's say you extracted DNA from an organism that you wanted to study, like you wanted to sequence it or whatever, you're always kind of limited by just how much high quality DNA you could actually extract from the tissues of, a, uh, of your sample, right? So the ability to make a ton of perfect copies of that little bit of DNA that you were able to get what was a very important uh, hallmark, uh, critical kind of discovery that enables us to do lots of research these days. Uh, but just from our discussion today, you can already kind of uh, think about what are the minimum things that you would need in order to do this. So in order to copy a single strand of DNA, you would need, of course, the original template DNA that you're trying to copy, right? Because that provides the template for making any copies of DNA, you would need a pool of DNTPs, right? deoxynucleotide triphosphates that are floating around in your test tube so that they could each be used right, to make the growing strand. You would need to have, yeah, the big enzyme complex, a DNA polymerase that could actually read the template and assemble these free floating DNTPs, adding them on so that you make the new strand. And you would still need some kind of a primer on the template to start the DNA polymerase going, right? Because the DNA polymerase, it cannot start from scratch. There has to be some sort of primer, some sort of short sequence to start off the process of, of the DNA polymerase. Because we're talking about doing this artificially, you know, and you know, let's say you already know what part of the DNA you want to make a ton of copies of, that means you can make the little primer synthetically, right? You can, there are machines that can make short little uh, polymers of nucleotides and that would be your primer. So you get to choose your primer based upon what part of the DNA you're actually trying to copy. And because you get to choose it, right? It doesn't have to be RNA, 
right? Because you're making this in a little machine. So you can actually make a short little piece of DNA as the primer. And that can then stick to the part of the template that you've chosen because you've specifically designed the primer to match up to the template in that region. And that'll start the DNA polymerase going. So really that's all you need, right? But, you know, it's not that simple because how do you control the DNA double helix being opening up, right? And also being allowed to come back together again as a, uh, as a double helix. So this makes for exciting possibilities for producing large amounts of identical DNA molecules from very little starting material. <clears throat> but the technical challenges are, how are you gonna make a single stranded DNA de template from a starting double helix molecule, right? If you don't have all those other proteins that help encourage things like replicon bubbles to form, you know, you have those inside your living cells, but even if you throw all those into a test tube, you know, how would you expect that they would actually work together? Another question is, would the DNA polymerase, the big machine that does this making of the new strand, would it even work under laboratory conditions, like in a test tube? And then once you've made that first copy of the DNA, then what? Then wouldn't the whole process just stop right there? So great, you started from one DNA molecule and you've succeeded in making two DNA molecules, right? Whoopee, right? Because how is that gonna help you? So there has to be some way to make this process continue. So you can go from two to four to eight to 16 to millions, et cetera. So this has to do with what we talked about last time, that one of the properties of DNA uh, that we take advantage of is the fact that temperature affects the DNA structure, right? We talked about this slide last time, so I won't go into it in a ton of detail again, but remember, this takes advantage of the fact that the hydrogen bonding between the base pairs is pretty weak. If you put some energy in there and get the atoms moving around, right, you can encourage the base pairing to kind of fall apart, right? Because the complementary base pairs, the A's across from T's, the C's across from G's, right? If they're shaking around because of energy, then the hydrogen bonds, maybe they don't line up anymore, so they lose those hydrogen bonds, right? So the DNA can separate at high temperatures, let's say at 90 degrees Celsius. Right? And then if you cool this down again, oh, the two strands will come back together based upon uh, the base pairing. Hmm. So that's what we're going to do, right? So you say, oh, yeah, that's what I do. I heat up the DNA to get the two strands to fall apart. And that's how I, I, I replicate it. But here's the problem. At 90 degrees, at that high of a temperature, the double-stranded DNA falls apart. But at 90 degrees Celsius, the proteins like the DNA polymerase complex, that machine, it's also going to fall apart, right? Because all those proteins are the right shape evolutionarily to work at 37 degrees Celsius, right? So the amino acid sequence that makes up these polypeptide chains of proteins that are folded up, they evolved or they evolved to be that sequence so that at 37 degrees Celsius, right? The, the energy that's surrounding is the right sort of uh, conditions for that DNA Paul three to be the right shape to work. So at 90 degrees, yeah, you've separated the two DNA strands, but you've now messed up your DNA polymerase. So that's not gonna work. And you say, well, I better cool it down then. So you cool it back down to a lower temperature, like you know 37 or 40 degrees so that your DNA polymerase doesn't get all messed up. But then what happens to the DNA template? It comes back together again, right? So it's not gonna work either. So the Problem is that human DNA Paul three won't work at high temperatures, right? Because they will denature. Human DNA Paul three has evolved to fold and work best at 37 degrees Celsius. So the solution here, right? Oh, this is the, 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 the dilemma. At temperatures hot enough to keep the DNA unwound, you'll denature the DNA Paul three, but at lower temperatures that are just right for the DNA Paul three proteins to work, you know, the DNA itself will reform a double helix and you won't be able to copy any template strand again. So the solution that uh, was uh, discovered in the mid 1980s, and this is the real breakthrough um, sort of uh, discovery is, you know, nobody says you have to use human DNA polymerase to do this in a test tube, right? Because if all life on earth uses some form of DNA polymerase to copy their DNA, then you can use the version 
of DNA polymerase three from some other organism. And you can choose an organism that is used to living or evolved to live at high temperatures, right? Because then you know its version of DNA Pol three, right? Is the right sequence so that it will actually work well at high temperatures. So the breakthrough solution is don't use the human DNA Pol three. So we use DNA polymerases from bacteria that evolve to live in environments, in ecosystems that are extremely hot, right? These are extremophiles. For example, the bacteria that thrive in the um, deep ocean floor thermal vents, right? So this is where there's thermal activity. Uh, you know, so you have these like towers of where you have basically steam coming out because the temperatures here can be extremely hot, right? And so there are bacteria that evolve to thrive in these temperatures. Ah, one example of them is this bacteria known as, known as Thermus aquaticus, right? and it lives near these hydrothermal vents in the ocean. So if you take the DNA polymerase from Thermus aquaticus, right? so that's why we call it TAC polymerase, if you were to line up its amino acid sequence of its DNA Pol3, the version it has, against the version of human DNA polymerase, uh, this figure might look a little confusing here. You're not supposed to memorize this or anything, but what it shows is that at critical amino acid positions in the polypeptide chain that makes up the protein that's gonna fold up, right? At certain positions, you have to have a particular amino acid there in order to re really make sure the shape of this thing's correct. In those cases, those amino acids are conserved between the TAC bacteria and us, right? In, in its version of the DNA Pol3, but other regions of the Pol3 proteins that aren't as important for the actual function, but allow for the overall shape to kind of be maintained, right, that's where you see variations. And those variations in those amino acids mean that the TAC DNA Pol3 stays the right shape at high temperatures, like 90 degrees, right? Whereas our version of the protein would just come apart and denature at those temperatures. So that's why we use TAC DNA polymerases for lab-based DNA replication. Right. So these are the steps then of PCR. Um, I should also say back in the 80s, when this was first discovered, they didn't have fancy PCR thermocyclers, right? Because at that time, nobody knew how to do PCR, how to do this. So why would they have made such a machine, right? Back then, they used to use separate water baths at different temperatures in order to do this. And you would actually move samples from water bath to water bath. Uh, but the three main steps are you heat up the DNA so that it denatures. So for example, heating it to 95 degrees. Then you cool it a little bit so that those primers that you've intentionally designed that are mixed in there have a chance to anneal. They will anneal to the little sequences that you've designed. So you've designed two primers, one that's in this direction here, five prime to three prime, one that's in this direction over here, right? Uh, going this way, five prime to three prime. Right? Then you lower the temperature just enough so that the tack DNA polymerase can really be efficient, right? So the TAC DNA polymerase, you know, it doesn't love being at 90 degrees Celsius. It actually works best at around 72 degrees. Still though, that's like twice as hot as what our body cells normally handle. So you lower the temperature to 72 and then the TAC DNA polymerase begins to make the copy strands. And the critical thing here is that once you go through one round, right? You then start from the beginning again, you heat you heat this up. So now you have two molecules, right? Each one of those molecules then will separate in step one, you let your primers anneal in step two, three. And so that's how you get this polymerase chain reaction, right? So again, the things you need to do this are listed here. And I added to this adjustable heating cooling equipment, right? Because you can imagine back in the 80s, if you had to do this over and over again, like one minute here, two minutes here, whatever, for like 30, 40, 50 times, I mean, boy, you're, you're, that's really tedious. So now we have the thermocyclers that do this, All right? And what we're trying to do is greatly amplify the DNA sequence. So let's say this example here, you know, you have this boom box and it's playing a song. Right, and it's on this big campus. The campus looks kind of empty because maybe this is like COVID time, 
but you know you have a hard time hearing the song you have a hard time making out the signal right one way you can deal with it right is to make a much larger signal of that so pcr allows for much easier detection and analysis of DNA sequences, it allows you to isolate and purify just the DNA regions that you care about if you want to study. And you can save these, you know, and then you can also manipulate them. You can do little experiments, maybe add mutations, right? So if you have a hard time hearing the very small amounts of starting DNA, if you can amplify it, then you can really hear, oh, I know this song, I can hear every note of the song and all the lyrics. So this is just the last slide to wrap up. So this polymerase chain reaction then has really revolutionized our ability to use DNA as a tool, right? And what's really exciting is those of you who are taking the 275 lab class with Dr. Yoshizawa, uh, you guys will be doing PCR. Um, I don't know if it's this week or in a coming week, uh, but you'll actually get to do this and hopefully you'll be able to have a better appreciation for why this technique is so important, okay? All right. Let's go ahead and stop there. <clears throat>